So now we come to the tensor formulation of special relativity. And here we're going to combine what we've learned in the tensor algebra section with what we've done um, with the special relativity section so far. So Einstein had done unbelievably uh, amazing work, okay, one of the greatest intellectual achievements of humankind. So here he is at his blackboard um, with the Lorentz transformations that you've seen um, in front of him. Uh, but after Einstein had written down the special theory, then along came Hermann Minkowski, who was a German physicist, mathematical physicist and mathematician. And he realized that special relativity could be written in a tensor formulation. Um, and it's not surprising, so the special principle of relativity is that all natural phenomena, so the laws of all, the laws of physics, are the same in all inertial reference frames. Okay, so we shouldn't be surprised that tensors, which are quantities that transcend coordinates, are the natural objects for special re relativity. So we're going to look at this in more detail. So the postulates of special relativity led us to the fact that we had some invariant interval, ds squared, and this was equal to um, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared minus c squared dt squared. And we said that we could write this as dx mu, whoops, eta mu nu, and this eta is our metric, dx nu, okay, where mu is an index that runs from 0 to 3, so we have four coordinates, and these four coordinates are, so this is x mu, which represents all four coordinates, it's ct is mu equals 0, x is mu equals 1, y and z. Okay, so this is our four-dimensional space-time. And this is the coordinate system that we want to work with and that Minkowski uh, advocated. Okay, so let me read. So this is what Minkowski said. So he said that henceforth space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away merely into shadows. And only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. Okay, so a very grand statement. Um, but its point is that our reality that we inhabit should be thought of in terms of space-time. Okay, so we could equally write this as dx mu with a covariant guy and a metric that is uh, contravariant, like this. Okay, and this metric is the inverse metric. So if we do uh, eta mu mu, we have to choose a different index alpha, eta alpha nu. This gives us the identity matrix delta mu nu. Okay, or in matrix form, you can have eta dot eta equals one, okay? So these are just two ways of writing the identity matrix in 4D space. Okay, and this eta we know is a diagonal matrix with signature uh, minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. Okay, so it's a four by four matrix with uh, minus one, plus one, plus one, and plus one on the diagonals. Okay, so we've got a four-dimensional space that's a metric space, and this is our metric tensor, and our metric that's the thing that's invariant from coordinate to coordinate is this ds squared. Okay, so we're now going to think about how we can write general Lorentz transformations in terms of uh, these covariant and contravariant quantities and the metric. So we want to think specifically about transformations, Lorentz transformations, in which the point x mu equals zero 
This is a four-dimensional relationship. Corresponds to the point in a different coordinate system where x mu bar equals zero. Okay, so this is just our standard configuration that we saw before, where the two frames, their coordinate origins overlapped at t equals t bar equals zero. And in this case, we can write down our Lorentz transformations, and they are homogeneous. Okay, we can write down that x bar mu equals, and in special relativity, we write the Lorentz transformation as lambda, big lambda, mu, that's this contravariant index, and then we have a covariant index nu, x nu. Okay. Um, so this is for the components of our forward position. And the inverse of this is x mu equals lambda. And this is a different lambda than this one. This has a mu here and a nu here. x nu bar. Okay, this is the inverse. So this lambda is different from this. And note that the indices are staggered. So mu comes to the left of nu and vice versa here. Okay, and if you think back to your tensor algebra, this thing is just dx bar mu by dx nu. And this thing is just dx by dx bar uh, with a mu here and a nu here. Okay, so these are analogous to the Jacobian matrices, and but in special relativity we call these big lambdas. And remember that we know that our transformation is linear, so these lambdas only depend on constants. Uh, for example, we saw that the boost in the x direction, so when you have two frames moving away from each other along the x direction. We saw that we had c, t, x, y, and z. This is our x bar mu. Could be written as gamma minus gamma beta minus gamma beta gamma zero zero one zero 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 one. 0, 0, 0, C, T, X, Y, and Z. This thing is X mu. Okay, or uh, keep the notation consistent, X nu. And this is our lambda mu nu. Okay. So note that these are constants in the sense that they don't depend on the coordinates. Okay, they depend, gamma depends on the velocity that the two frames are separating, but, um, but not on the coordinates. Okay, and this lambda and this lambda are inverses of each other. So we have lambda alpha mu times lambda alpha nu. This equals delta mu nu. Okay, the identity matrix. Okay, so we stagger the indices to denote which is which. Okay, so when the contravariant index is on the left, this is the kind of direct transformation. When it's on the right, so the covariant index on the left, this is the inverse Lorentz matrix. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so we have this invariant interval ds squared equals dx mu, eta mu nu, dx nu. Okay, and this eta is our metric. And if you go back to your tensor algebra section, and specifically the, the metric tensor section, 
you'll see that we considered a change of coordinates from x to x bar and we asked what happened to the metric and we saw that g our metric went to g bar which was equal to a, a j transpose g j okay and here our j and j transpose are our lambdas so here we find in special relativity that our eta bar which just equals eta okay it's a diagonal matrix with minus one 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 okay and let me make these matrices we find that eta bar equals j transpose and this is our lambda transpose eta lambda okay so we find a very important result that eta equals lambda transpose eta lambda okay and we haven't really said much about the lambdas other than there's some linear transformation so this result is almost enough to tell us everything about special relativity okay, and it defines what a Lorentz transformation can be it's any quantity lambda that satisfies this relationship okay so there are different types of Lorentz transformation and we're going to start from this equation and we'll have a look at them Okay, so we've seen that our position, our x mu transforms with a Lorentz transformation lambda mu nu x nu. Okay, and this Lorentz transformation matrix lambda is just our Jacobian. Okay, it's like our J bar matrix, except in special relativity, it's so special that we give it a, a different name, we call it lambda. And then we can have the inverse transformation which takes us from um, x bar nu to an x mu and here the lambda is different if this is j bar then this must be j so we don't use bars in special relativity we denote the distinction between them by the way we stagger okay, the indices okay so here we have mu on the top left here the first index is on the left okay so this is new and then this is mu okay okay so we distinguish between j and j bar by how we place the indices okay so if it's the superscripts to the top left that's the j bar matrix that takes us from the unbarred to the barred okay if the superscripts on the right of the two indices then that's the inverse matrix okay and I think there's a problem in your problem sheet for asking you to show that these are, in, are inverses of each other okay so just like we did in the tensors we worked with vectors for the first week and then we generalized to tensors now we can write down uh, what our four tensors are okay so this is not one two three four tensors it's four tensors all one word think about it like this okay so four tensors these are tensors in our four dimensional space time okay so n equals four in our space time okay so remember x mu is ct x y and z okay so we've got four dimensions so a four tensor is a set of quantities. Let's call it T. Okay, and it's got P covariant, sorry, P contravariant indices and Q covariant indices. Beta one to beta Q. Okay, and remember before that 
the number of functions is n, the dimension of the space, to the power of the rank. And here we've got a four-dimensional space, and the rank here is p plus q. Okay. So a four tensor is a set of these four to the p plus q quantities that transform in a special way. And that special way is as follows. It takes us to the t bar set of quantities, and that's called a mu1, mu2, up to mu p, and mu1, mu2, up to mu q. Okay. And then we've got to fill in what the transformation is. Okay, but hopefully you're preempting what I'm going to write. We know how one of the vectors, the contravariant vector, transforms, and we know how the covariant indices transform. So for each of these contravariant indices, we get one of these lambdas. And for each of these Q uh, covariant indices, we get one of these lambdas. Okay, so a four tensor is just something, some set of quantities that transforms like, fo like the following. So we get a mu1 and an alpha one. Okay, so this guy operates on the alpha one and gives us the mu one. Then we've got a mu two alpha two up to mu p alpha p. Okay, so this takes care of the contravariant indices. And then we've got a set of the inverse lambdas. So lambda now has nu1 at the bottom left and beta1 on the top right. Okay, lambda nu2 on the bottom left, beta2 on the top right. And this goes up to lambda nu q, beta q. Okay. So again, note the staggering of the indices. So in this bracket, the indices at the top always come to the left of the indices at the bottom. In this bracket, which deals with the covariant components, the indices are at the left. Okay, so the first index uh, is the, super, the subscript in this case. Okay, so one of them you think of as the matrix J, and the other one is our J bar. Okay, if you want to go back to your tensor algebra notes. Okay. So this is just a four tensor. It's a set of n to the r, so four to the p plus q quantities that transform like this. Okay, under Lorentz transformations. So these are quantities that transform like this because the speed of light is invariant in different um, the speed of light is invariant to all inertial observers. Okay, so let's think about some examples. So let's have P equals one, Q equals zero. Okay, and this is a contravariant. Okay, so P is one, so we've got one index. Okay, so we know, we've already seen an example where we have this, it's our position. Okay, so our, it's our X mu, this is a position for vector. Okay. Um, we could also have P equals zero, Q equals one. Okay, and an example of that is our X mu covariant four vector. Okay, so these things are called four vectors. They are vectors, so they've got one index in four dimensional space. And the four dimensional space we're in is this CT XYZ. Okay, so we'll mainly be concerned with four vectors in the course, but we'll also see some rank two tensors. And one of them will be the electric, electromagnetic field tensor, and it depends on two indices, either covariant or contravariant. Okay, so it's rare that we'll have any more than two um, indices. Okay, so don't be frightened. 
this is just what we've seen for tensor algebra, except instead of working in n-dimensional space, we've chosen four dimensions. Okay, so we've we've made things simpler for ourselves. We've specified four dimensions instead of n. And this is just what we saw in the tensor algebra course section of the course, uh, except we've changed what we call j, and we call them lambda now. Okay, so this is just almost just a different notation for the same thing. Okay, um, but it's in the context of our special relativity where we know that the speed of light is invariant between all inertial observers. Okay, so these Jacobian matrices are for that type of transformation. Okay, so if you remember, we have our invariant length, ds squared. And we can write this as x, well, let's have a dx mu, eta mu nu, dx nu. And eta is our metric tensor, so we can raise or lower our indices. So this eta mu nu, dx nu, can just be written as dx nu, sorry, mu, mu. Okay, so this can be dx mu, dx mu, okay. And we sum over this index mu, okay, so the, the, no, the number that we get is invariant, and it describes a length. Okay, so in general, we have lengths of four vectors. So we can have a four vector, it doesn't have to be the position four vector, it could be anything. Okay, velocity four vector, momentum four vector, um, etc. that we'll come to see. But let's call the four vector A, mu, and it's got four components, A0, A1, A2, A3. Okay, we can work out what A mu is by lowering the indices, lowering the index uh, as follows. Okay, so we act with a metric tensor, mu nu. And this lowers this index. And remember our metric tensor is minus 1, 1, 1, 1, with zeros everywhere else. Okay, and this acts on A nu, which is A0, A1, A2, A3. Okay, so the result... Hi Dermot, how can I help? So the result is uh, minus 1 times A0. Minus a zero, plus a one, plus a two, plus a three, and this is our covariant four vector. Okay. So the covariant differs from the contravariant by the change of sign, plus to minus in the first index. Okay. So because this first kind of time time index is negative and all the others are positive, then it helps, or we can, and it's useful, to think about this component as special and then these three together as a vector, okay? So this is the time component and this is the three vector that involves three components, A1, A2, and A3. Okay, so you'll see some four vectors, A, mu, written in this form. Okay, so let's think about the length. So the length of a four vector, we can call it this mod a, a mu, a mu, okay? We're summing over the indices, so we'll get a scalar, we'll get a number. Okay, and this we can think of as a mu, eta, mu, nu, a nu, just as we've written above. But if we know a mu, then we know that a mu is just the same thing but with a minus here. Okay, so this will be minus a zero squared, take this away, uh, plus, and then we'll have the three vector squared, the magnitude of this thing squared. Okay, so this is the length of a vector, a four vector. Okay, this is length of four vector.
Okay, and similarly we can have an inner product of a mu with b mu, and this will be minus a0 b0, so the zeroth component, and then we'll have plus a three vector dot b three vector. Okay. Okay, so it'll take a bit of practice just getting used to all these indices, um, but we'll do some examples where we'll reuse indices and lower them, and I'll give you some of that in problem set four, um, just as practice as well. So we've been working with the four position, okay? So it's a four vector that tells us what the position of something is. Um, but there are also other four vectors, and one of them is the four velocity. Okay, so this is four velocity. And of course, velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. So this is a d mu. with respect to time, and this is going to be v mu, our four velocity. Um, but rather than think about the derivative with respect to the inertial frame time, okay, so let's think about me standing still in this room, and there's a clock flying through the air. Um, rather than thinking about the time on my watch, while I watch this thing flying through the air, let's use the time on the clock itself. So this is, remember, the proper time. Okay. Um, and the reason is this thing is invariant. Okay, proper time is invariant. And we know that dx mu is a four vector. So we have a four vector multiplied by some invariant thing. Um, so we'll know that the result is also a four vector. So this is our four velocity, okay? And we can think, if we go back to our time dilation, remember that moving clocks run slowly. So our proper time is equal to the time in the inertial frame. Okay, so this is the time on the thing that's moving. And dt is the ticks on the clock in the stationary frame. So we have to think about where we put the gamma. Okay, so moving clocks run slower. So the proper time will be the time measured in the lab divided by gamma. Okay, so the time on the moving clock runs uh, as dt divided by gamma. Okay, so this means that our v mu, our velocity, our four velocity, is equal to uh, okay, so we've got a dx mu by d tau, and d tau is dt times gamma. Okay, dt over gamma, sorry. So we get a gamma on the top. Okay, so this is gamma, which depends on v, remember, the three velocity, the speed. d by dt of ct x, y, and z, okay, that's our position. So this is gamma, v, and then we've got d by dt of ct, that's just c. And then we've got d by dt of x, y, and z, and that's just our three vector v. Okay, so we can write our four velocity, v mu, as gamma, v, and then a four vector, c, v. Okay, sorry, the whole thing's a four vector. Okay, with some constant gamma out the front. Okay, so v mu transforms just like rx. So we can have a v mu bar equals lambda mu nu v nu. Okay, v mu is a four vector. Okay, it's the four velocity. Okay, and then similarly we can have four acceleration. And of course, that's just d2x mu by d tau squared. And that's called f mu. Okay, and if you look at your notes, you'll see how that is transformed. 
Okay, so we'll work with these four velocities and uh, really we'll introduce four momentum when we start doing the relativistic mechanics problems. Um, but there are different types of four vectors and the only thing that they have to satisfy is this relationship. Okay, they transform under change of inertial reference frames with this Lorentz matrix.